Welcome to IdeaGen TV. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing Graham McMillan, president of the Visa Foundation. Graham, welcome. Thank you for having me, George. Pleasure to see you. Great to see you again. I believe the last time we saw you was at the United Nations speaking about the global goals, those 17 global goals of the UN. And here we are in 2023. And I know you have a lot of plans for this year, uh, exciting plans. And I'd love for our global audience to hear a bit about what you're planning to do this year at the Visa Foundation. Well, I appreciate, uh, again, George, the opportunity to tell a bit about our story. And on behalf of the 26,000 employees that we have at Visa and uh, the work of the Visa Foundation, we have a, a big year ahead of us. We're going to continue to support Visa's uh, purpose, which is to uplift everyone everywhere by enabling financial inclusion for small businesses and communities around the world. And as I'm sure as you can appreciate, we operate in a lot of communities around the world. We have a particular focus on access to uh, uh, capital that supports gender diverse small micro businesses. We also support communities where Visa employees live and work. Uh, we, we help communities respond in times of natural disaster, and we also support our employee giving programs. So we're quite busy, and 2023 is really about a year of acceleration and better helping to tell the impact story of our partners, both our grantees and our investees, and really helping them um, uplift them in the work that they're doing. So as part of this Global Leadership Summit, it's incredible to hear the breadth and depth of the work that you're you're pursuing and, and that impact, that overall impact that you're having literally across the planet with millions of individuals. And, and so impact investing. Graham, what specific areas within impact investing are you working on and having that, that focus on for 2023 and beyond? So, George, before I uh, speak to 2023, I, I, just to kind of give you a story of our journey and how we how we got here. Uh, when um, when Visa Foundation was created about six and a half years ago, one of the things that um, is part of our our makeup and gives us, I think, a, a distinct message is that we were capitalized with about four hundred million dollars in assets, which is, uh, as you can appreciate, somewhat unusual for corporate foundations. But what it really gave us is an opportunity to do two things. One is to, to think long term and to plan long term and to partner through grant making long, in a long term relationship. But it also allows us to invest out of our en endowment to further our mission. And so in early days of our journey, uh, we were really able to put together a strategy that incorporated both grant making as well as impact investing to advance our focus on supporting gender diverse small micro businesses around the world. And so the approach that we take is really an integrated approach and um, it really utilizes both those tools to support um, uh, partners that are directly interacting with the small micro businesses that we that we care about. Uh, about three years ago, we made a commitment as part of a signature uh, program that we call Equitable Access. And it was a $200 million five-year commitment to enable 200, uh, $140 million of private market impact investments alongside about $60 million of grant making to support the development and growth of more diverse uh, small businesses. And what we've learned along the way is the tremendous demand for capital, of course, and I know you can appreciate that, but it's more than just the capital that's needed by these small businesses. It's really enabling the partners that deploy that capital, whether they be grants and investments, to really look at communities that have historically been um, missed, which is to say, uh, gender uh, and underrepresented communities where, to give you an example, in the United States, there's roughly $70 trillion of wealth uh, in financial assets, and only one uh, to 3% of that capital is controlled by women or underrepresented communities. And so we know that as investors and other partners put money into communities, they do so to communities that they understand. And so our objective now, and it has really been focusing, and we'll really bring this to 2023 and beyond, is to really continue to deploy 100% of our capital into funds and other intermediaries that are controlled by the communities that we are focused on. So that is to say, gender diverse um, fund investors. And to date, we've done about $125 million in private market investments across asset classes, which is to say venture capital, private equity, private debt, 
what we really have all the tools necessary to meet the particular needs uh, and circumstances. And where we can, we also deploy grant resources to support that work. Uh, so it gives us a pretty unique value proposition. And for 2023, we anticipate uh, deploying an additional $40 million of investments uh, globally, uh, because as I said before, we have a global footprint uh, and it will continue to be in funds that represent the communities that we care about. And it will be a mix of early first time fund managers uh, and some more established partners uh, as part of a prudent financial investment strategy. And this all really demonstrates the leadership, uh, the leadership style that you bring to the Visa Foundation as president. And I'd like to ask you, what specific leadership style do you bring to the foundation? What is that key element that, of leadership that you espouse to help the foundation be as, as effective as possible? The my res primary responsibility as the president of the Visa Foundation is to create a set of conditions that allows the team to be successful in our mission and our plans, uh, to create an enabling environment for them to thrive, to innovate, to continue to learn, and to be the best partners possible to, to the organizations that we serve. And when things go well is to celebrate them and let them have success. And when things don't go well, and, and, and oftentimes they won't go well, is for me to take the responsibility and to, to, to move forward. Uh, my, my privilege is ultimately to foster a culture within the team and with our partners of innovation, adaptation, uh, and aspiration. And that's really what gets me excited about this job on, and, and really to represent the values of all the employees that, that um, work at Visa and who really want to see uh, Visa's values manifest in the communities that we are here to support. Well, that's really remarkable and inspiring to hear. And so going back to the impact investing, the millions of dollars that you're investing, what sort of processes, what sort of processes do you undergo to determine where these investments will be made? Well, all of our work is anchored in a strategy uh, that, uh, of course, we uh, work through our board of directors uh, to approve and, and to implement. We are trying to fulfill a number of objectives. One is first and foremost, an impact objective, of course. And this is fundamentally about the number of small micro businesses we reach, the uh, revenue change that results of because of the intervention our partners are bringing to bear uh, the, and the jobs that are created. There are a series of other factors that uh, I, I can mention perhaps later on in the conversation, but those are our primary metrics when we think about the work that we're trying to do in the impact investing strategy. And then ultimately what we're trying to do is be representative of where Visa operates, uh, which I said is globally. And so we are invested in markets in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, to Southeast Asia, to Europe, to the United States, and being able to be diverse geographically, uh, but also to be relevant to the issues that exist in those particular markets and regions. And so we construct a portfolio that is representative of those factors. Uh, and we work with our investment committee, which is chaired by Visa's treasurer uh, and a number of other really uh, capable um, professionals within Visa to analyze those opportunities, again, across asset classes. And we really analyze the strategy of the fund partners that we're looking at, the composition of the management team, the capability and alignment to potential impact. Uh, and then it takes a period of time, of course, in, 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 in conversations and in the diligencing process for us to be able to approve that investment. And ultimately, uh, it really leads to, as I said, about $40 million in private market investments a year that, again, have a range of different types of returns that meet our objectives, but also have a range of different of, of impact uh, results that roll up to our, our strategy. Absolutely incredible. And so how would you describe the element of impact investing and corporate responsibility, that, that corporate responsibility leading into that investment decision? Well, I, you know, it's interesting because the terminology is, uh, the language that we use really is important. And I think the origins of the terminology that, that exist in impact investing are born from a particular place that speaks to how uh, the social impact work that so many of us are focused on, whether it came out of philanthropy or, or international development, 
it was, it was an attempt to, to suggest that you can take capital, invest it wisely, generate a return, and also generate a measurable impact. And as we know, for more than 15 years now, there's been a real track record of being able to demonstrate that with some degree of success. And I'm being really specific, George, in saying particularly private market investing, where that impact is more measurable than perhaps the public markets, which is a bit of a different conversation. But I think what we've observed in the past five years are leading companies that acknowledge that their operations, their investment, whether it's investment in people, investment in customers and clients, their relationships with partners around the world, stakeholders, requires them to think about how they allocate capital against a risk and an opportunity spectrum. And so one of the things that we are seeing increasingly here at the Visa Foundation is the, the impact investment work that we're doing and our ability to articulate the impact in the markets that we're operating in is helping to share is helping to inform opportunities for the company more broadly. And that's manifest in a number of uh, 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 projects and efforts that we've done, including uh, issuing a green bond, for instance, uh, putting uh, um, money to work uh, from our treasury into minority deposit institutions here in the United States and a series of other examples. So what I really ultimately see is a convergence over time. And it's acknowledging that there, you know, a lens of equity and inclusion is really about a story of growth. Uh, and we're just a specialized tool that can help companies like Visa and others really understand where that growth opportunity exists. What incredible perspective. I mean, to, to hear the way you describe, you know, where you're making the investments, how are you considering making the investments, and the overall total of investments is profound. And so I'd like to go back to your leadership journey. Uh, would you be willing and, and kindly so willing to share your leadership journey? How, how did you evolve into the leader you are today? Well, I, you know, I don't know that I'm any more of a leader than everybody that I work with, whether it's the members of the team, uh, who support the foundation or even our partners. I mean, we're all leaders in our own right. I, I guess it's more, you know, the responsibility, the role that I play in my leadership uh, privilege, which is really what, what I have. George, at the end of the day, I've just been incredibly lucky to work for some of the best and brightest people. And that, in your own journey, I'm sure you can attest, that's what matters. Uh, I can remember the first person I ever worked for professionally uh, is a wonderful woman named Meredith Tilp. And this was when I first started working at Helen Keller International, a tremendous uh, non-governmental organization, international development organization. And, and Meredith taught me so much in the earliest days of my career. And what I've come to realize, and I was reflecting on this actually recently, is that she's actually fundamentally a teacher. Uh, and, and you can imagine being a young professional, your first manager being a teacher, even though she had a different role at the time, was such an incredibly powerful on-ramp for me to understand um, how to grow and take on opportunity and the, the risk and, and learning uh, that was a part of that journey to my uh, most recent previous employer, uh, Ford Foundation. I had the honor and privilege of working with Darren Walker. Of course, so many people I'm sure who will watch this, uh, this conversation will know Darren and, and I've had the privilege to work with him one-on-one -on -one. But I've also had the privilege to see him uh, as a leader from the outside transform philanthropy and frankly, not even just philanthropy, but have the courage to ask hard questions of of so many people and institutions that really affect not just hundreds of millions of people, but ultimately billions of people. And it's really that combination and everybody in between that I've worked with that really helped me um, have some um, grounding in, in, in confidence as I've arrived at, at this role now and being about three and a half years here at, uh, at Visa. And thank you for that, because I think, you know, it's so important to note that we all stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say. And you just mentioned several of those in uh, who are, I'm sure there's a whole line of folks along the way, like you just mentioned, that have impacted your career and set you on a path to where you are today at the Visa Foundation as president. Who are some additional folks? You just mentioned a few that you can point to to say, yes, they impacted me in profound ways. And maybe at that time you did or did not realize it, but here you are today and you look back and you say, these are folks, these are leaders, these are individuals. And by the way, I really like how you said you're all 
leaders in your organizations, because it is it is true. Um, who are some of these giants that you today stand on the shoulders of? Oh, geez, this is I mean, I, I don't know that we have that much time in a conversation because the list is is long and, and some some names are, I suppose, better better known than, than others. But I, I, I think there's a few names that I'll just mention quickly that come to mind. Uh, I, I think there's there's two people that I'd like to draw on in particular uh, that really taught me so much about philanthropy uh, and, and how to be effective in different in different forms of philanthropy. One, uh, corporate philanthropy, and another, what you might call sort of venture or private philanthropy. First was is a woman named Anne Marie Burgoyne, who uh, who's currently at the Emerson Collective. She uh, took a chance on an organization that I and a few others had um, were starting to grow called Vision Spring, and this is George some years back, uh, circa 2004. Um, and at the time, she is with a wonderful uh, funder called Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, and this is just a tremendous model of helping start helping start up social enterprises, not just get access to funding and capital, but really grow their capability, governance, system structures. And Anne Marie uh, is was and is just I think one of the smartest, most capable philanthropists that I've ever worked for, and one of the, just the kindest people. And she, but what she really taught me that I bring today is a lot around governance uh, and how to build out the strength of go the governance that's, as you can appreciate, so necessary and critical to organizations being effective. Uh, and she she just continues to have a tremendous track record at Emerson Collective. And I'd strongly recommend to your audience to, 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 to follow the work that they're doing there. The other person, and you'll see a pattern here, a number of the folks I've mentioned are people I, I reported to uh, is a woman named Brandy McHale, who um, I'm not actually sure what Brandy's title is these days, but she really is in charge of most of the community investing and philanthropy at Citigroup uh, and the City Foundation. And she was m my point of entry to working in corporate philanthropy when I joined City some years ago uh, around around 2010. And she just she's one of the best grant makers I've ever met. And she is so fundamentally connected to making the decisions that are anchored in what is best for the grantee and the partner. Uh, being mindful, of course, of the context of, of you know, the fiduciary responsibility and also what's good for the uh, for the company or the organization. But she just always seemed to land on the right way to support an organization and acknowledging that the the, the power of the uh, the resources, whether they be financial, the brand, the capabilities of the of the of the company or the and or the foundation, she really was uh, the ultimate conductor and how how to bring that to bear. And I just, George, in all of these circumstances, had the opportunity to work for these tremendous people firsthand. And really, in many ways, my responsibility is to is to pass that on to others. And so, here at Visa and the Visa Foundation, we're really focused very much on the culture of the team. And success to me is, of course, not just the impact that we have in the, in the deployment of our philanthropic resources, our investment resources, but it's also perpetuating a, a, a group of leaders that will, for the debt for decades to come, have far greater impact into the future than they are even now. Um, and if we can give them that enabling environment, that experience and support to learn now, to grow later, that to me is the real testament to, to um, success. And that's what I've learned from these these folks that I've mentioned to you today. Absolutely phenomenal. And so as we look at the investments that you're making in women and underrepresented communities, minority communities, et cetera, what specific areas can you point to along this long line, but what's, which ones stand out for you? What are the most, you know, oh my gosh, investments that you're making at this time or that you've made? Uh, I will mention uh, three, if I can. Uh, in the earliest days of the launch of our Equitable Access Initiative, which I mentioned to you, is almost about three years old. And you can appreciate that that means it was right around the time of the emergence of the pandemic. Uh, we had made this $200 million commitment in the face of this emerging uh, pandemic and you know, there was a moment where we said, well, maybe we need to be thinking about a different approach or how do we want to support these different communities or for that matter, 
the global community that was being impacted. And it was really uh, this moment, and I'd actually, it's a testament to, to the, our founder of the Visa Foundation, who's Al Kelly, Visa's chairman and CEO, who really said, no, actually, we should be supporting small and micro businesses because they are, they are being impacted and will be increasingly impacted over time by the pandemic. So yes, while we want to support frontline healthcare workers, we need to do that. And that's an urgent short-term need. What we have to acknowledge is the impact on the economy and, and particularly the communities that we are focused on who are most at risk of being impacted by the pandemic economically over the long term. And so one of the first investments that we made uh, in, again, in, in the throes of the pandemic was to a, a, a tremendous partnership called the California Rebuilding Fund, which was led by uh, a number of organizations, one Calvert Impact Capital, the state of California, and a number, number of other partners to provide liquidity to community development finance institutions across the state of California. Now you can appreciate California being a huge economy, our home state, um, and that the impact of, of COVID on that state was profound to small businesses being led by uh, women in, in, in underrepresented communities. And what this whole project was fundamentally about was essentially buying up the assets of the balance sheets of these community development finance institutions that didn't have enough room to provide that liquidity, that additional capital that these small businesses needed to survive. And what really is interesting that occurred is yes, that working capital helped some of these businesses to survive. And I'm thinking of a particular um, restaurant and I wish I could remember off the name off the top of my head, but it's a, an amazing ta uh, tamale uh, restaurant and actually production uh, factory where the business um, had been around for about 10 years. It almost went under actually 20 years. But what happened with this money is that the uh, business was able to not only survive, but they actually invested in an entirely new approach uh, to serving their customers because they had to, they had to adapt. And it's really in that moment where you say, well, this is a really geographically important place for Visa. The need is profound. The partnership is compelling. Wow, great. But from an investment standpoint, it's a pretty um, tried and true set of partners. The community development finance institutions are all incredibly reputable and the structuring of the of the project was really well done to two other examples that I'll share with you. One is uh, an investment that we recently made in a terrific fund called Arua Capital in Nigeria. And, and, and the founder of Arua Capital named is this terrific woman named Adesua Rhodes. And she uh, came to us about two, three years ago and said, I've got a terrific, I see a terrific opportunity to invest in high growth consumer businesses in Nigeria and, and West Africa more broadly. And I'd like to raise a fund uh, to be able to do so. And you can appreciate, here's a fact that's staggering, George, and, and I'll, I'll generally uh, describe it. I don't want to be too specific, but as I understand it, that there are only 10 venture capital funds led by women, African women in Africa, 10 in the entire continent. And that, and, and that, as you can appreciate, staggering but it's also not just staggering because it, it to me it's, it's it's a shame that that's the case but it's a huge missed opportunity Adesua saw a market failure and a market opportunity and she saw a need to raise a fund and visa foundation was the first investor institutional investor excuse me uh into uh, arua capital uh with a five million dollar investment and now it's since attracted uh multiples of that and we're, we're incredibly excited and another example and i'll just share very quickly is a fund called the Beacon Fund in Southeast Asia. It's investing specifically in uh, Philippines, um, Indonesia, and Vietnam, led by Shu Yin Tang. She's, an, again, an amazing track record as an investor. She wanted to create a fund that was specifically targeting women-led businesses, consumer growth, uh, with a slightly different investing model, particularly around debt. Um, and she just, again, was struggling to raise that institutional capital, and we were one of the first in. Um, so these are three examples that just get me excited about serving a need uh, both at the small business level, but also at the investor level and believing investors that others have overlooked. And we're already starting to see that particularly because Visa has supported this, it's attracted other investors. And so that's an additional impact that we're starting to, to, to pay attention to. Um, and I think we're, we're proud of, but most importantly, we're proud of the people we get to have the privilege to invest into. Well, these stories that you've just shared, Graham, are just awe-inspiring. You know, I'm awestruck by by the impact. You can imagine that you know, you know your your ability to articulate the impact and and the passion that clearly comes across for what you've accomplished collectively with your colleagues at Visa and the Visa Foundation is just phenomenal. 
So I, I would like to personally and professionally applaud you on literally changing the world and, and finding these bright spots for opportunity to help others and millions and millions of people literally and literally across the planet. So I, I, I come away from this interview with a deep sense of inspiration and also really a, an appreciation for your commitment and that of the foundation and visa for focusing on helping others because that is it's profound and it goes back to what we talked about in terms of corporate responsibility impact investing etc you've, you've done just an incredible job today on this interview and in articulating that that vision the impact and perhaps most importantly your global leadership thank you for that thank you for all you're doing how can folks find out more about the incredible work that you're doing at the visa foundation well george you're you're, you're far too generous in your your, your comments um I, I'm reminded every day that our job at Visa and as, as well as the Visa Foundation is, is really to uplift others. It's the nature of what we do describe it as putting the wind in the sails of our partners. Our partners are the ones that are doing the hard work. Our job is to give them the resources to be able to be effective and to listen to them and to respect their capability and the, the very uh, complex challenges that they're uh, taking on. And so uh, I will, uh, on behalf of them, um, accept your very kind words, but know that it's really the work that they're doing that ultimately is making the difference. Uh, to learn a little bit more about what we're up to, go to visa.com forward slash foundation. But of course, peruse the visa.com website and track us on uh, the various social media channels, whether it's LinkedIn or or Twitter or, or what have you. There are a lot of different stories that Visa is telling that go beyond what the foundation is supporting, but to actually what our business is doing. Uh, because that's the story that needs to be told, George, more and more is that business sees this work as central to its future, to opportunity growth. And I can tell you that some of the work that uh, my colleagues are doing within the business to advance social impact, environmental impact is really remarkable. So. Those are those are the directions uh, that I would ask your uh, viewers to uh, to follow. And, and of course, uh, I really ask on behalf of the, the foundation partners to go follow the links to the partners organizations themselves, because uh, certainly you can capture and understand the work that we're doing. But it's really, again, the work that they're doing that matters. Graham McMillan, president, Visa Foundation. Thank you to you and thank you to all of those organizations, to your point, that you're working with, that are on the ground doing the work. And back to you again and the Visa Foundation and Visa for supporting the critical elements of funding, of funding and resources for them to be able to actually create that impact. It's, it starts at the top, you all are leading the way and you're working with incredible partners across the planet. Thank you, thank you for changing the world and thank you for your interview with us here at IdeaGen Global today. Thank you, George, for the opportunity to tell our story. And I look forward to working with you into the future. Likewise, thank you.